so I think that the important thing to know about truth and reconciliation is that uh, the truth isn't in the past, so it's it's not something that's that's over now and now we've moved on to reconciliation. Um, the truth is that there are, are lots of things still happening um, specifically to our Indigenous children um, and to our Indigenous population um, that are not known to everyday Canadians. So we, like the truth is things are still happening uh, and we can't just jump right to reconciliation. Um, I hear in conversation that we need to be talking a lot about reconciliation um, to ease the guilt of students and teachers um, when we are embarking on this journey and, and I don't think that's really fair because jumping right to, right to reconciliation doesn't paint an accurate picture of, of the history of the Indigenous experience in Canada. Um, so we need to make sure that we're starting with truth and, and, and know that truth comes before reconciliation. Uh, and also know that reconciliation means different things to different people. So if we think about trying to include different Indigenous voices in our classroom, to some Indigenous people, reconciliation really isn't a thing yet. Um, and it's not really on the table because according to a, a lot of people, uh, there, aren't, there weren't really these awesome relationships to reconcile. Uh, so it's about... Um, kind of decolonizing and thinking about how do we create working relationships with allies to move forward together. Uh, and I think that that's something that a lot of educators need to know before we embark in this journey is to, to know um, that there is no one definition of either truth and reconciliation and that we need to include Indigenous voices when we're thinking about how to bring that into our classrooms. Teacher candidates have to know that this isn't going away and that this is important for Indigenous students and it's important for educators and it's important for non-Indigenous students to be part of this process. So if we ever can agree that reconciliation is a thing, it's not going to be a thing without two sides reconciling. So it can't be reconciliation if all of the non-Indigenous people are saying, yes, we're, we're reconciling and everything is great. And all the Indigenous people are like, no, we're not reconciling. It's not great. Um, and, and you get to be part of that process of figuring out what that is. So it's not going away. It is our responsibility. And if you don't think it's your responsibility, keep learning because you will find out that very soon that it is in fact your responsibility and that it is important. Uh, and if you don't think it's important and you have the heart to be a teacher, again, keep learning because you will find out uh, in a quick hurry why it is important. So I think as educators, before we embark on any type of new learning, uh, we need to think about what our own personal biases are um, and where we are, where we are coming from as individuals. Uh, I was at a professional development um, opportunity last fall where the facilitator said we need to start thinking um, about how all of our brains have been colonized um, and how colonization has affected all of us, those of, of Indigenous ancestry and settler ancestry. So I think before we um, kind of begin, we need to do some reflecting as individuals on like where am I at in this huge continuum of Indigenous education and how it, might that impact my students? Um, and, and who might be in my classroom. And is it possible that on September 1st, we know that there is um, a son of a missing and murdered indig Indigenous woman in our class? Maybe not. And is it possible that we might know that we have descendants of residential school survivors in our class? Like, we might not know that information, but when we're teaching this, we need to know that it's possible that we do have those students in front of us. And if, it's, if we're not able to create those relationships wherein we're informed of that right away, we need to teach with the possibility that that, that, that that is going to be real in our classrooms. Uh, some challenges are, you know, just feeling like you don't know enough to teach it. And um, there's, there's certainly been some direction, but, um, you know, we're all hungry for more because everyone is afraid of screwing up. And I think that that speaks to um, how important everybody thinks it is, whether or not they see it that way or not. Um, you know, educators are genuinely concerned that they're going to be appropriating knowledge um, or, or delivering misinformation. And I think that that's really honorable because people are are wanting to make sure that they're educating students properly. But what needs to happen next is to um, answer to the responsibility that you know, we, do, we do have to teach us as educators. We do owe it to our Indigenous students and non-Indigenous students. I think a lot about land acknowledgements. Um, you know, I've been 
uh, to several in-services and, and been to several functions where our, um, our land acknowledgement for my organization is read, both by Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And, and for some reason, I think a lot about it. Um, I think about it because when I go to uh, conferences and um, different kind of learning opportunities, say on territory, uh, the land acknowledgement seems a lot different there than we are situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. And, um, and so I, I go back and forth, like we are acknowledging it, and, but we're also like maybe not acknowledging it in a traditional way. And so what I've been taught about land acknowledgement is when you are on someone else's territory, you acknowledge that and you kind of do what they would do and act the way that they would act for, for the time that you're there. And so I see that we're, ha we're acknowledging the land. I, we acknowledge at the beginning of assemblies, we acknowledge at the beginning of gatherings um, that we are on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, but I don't necessarily see the second step. So, um, in our class, uh, we've really spent a lot of time with, with that acknowledgement of territory for our organization. Um, and our goal, we're working towards making it a more informal um, acknowledgement, but, but also a more traditional one where we're acknowledging, we're thanking our ancestors for what they did to make sure that we are able to walk on this land um, and thanking our, our friends' ancestors for doing what they could um, to make sure that we were able to be on this land. And we kind of, we kind of talk about it that way. Um, in t instead of the uh, instead of reciting the the land acknowledgement. We believe that Indigenous education is more than about delivering content and curriculum. It's about delivery and method and experience and like I totally recognize the privilege that I have in an alternative learning environment where we can do experiential learning um, and we are constantly like matching our minds with our muscles and trying to kind of learn in that way and it's challenging um, when you're not in that environment to and you're not used to thinking that way uh, it, it can be challenging to implement those ways of knowing into your classroom um, and feeling like you don't have the connections and there's like four people at the board that can help you and you maybe don't know those people or whatever so so that's I think a real challenge is like trying to retrain our minds uh, to think about you know this education as valuable so like I hear people talking about um, separating oral communication from the curriculum and from the important stuff and oral communication is important stuff and it actually is in the curriculum so um, we're not we're not going outside the curriculum when we're when we're doing a unit on oral communication and I think that we need to start thinking about the overall expectations that we're privileging um, and prioritizing and and thinking about like well how can I actually make this line up and when you actually spend some time with the curriculum you can a non-Indigenous person can make sure that their, their students are fed every day. Um, that doesn't, we don't need to rely on the Indigenous community for that and certainly we should be relying on the Indigenous community to come in and talk about on um, things like spirituality if we're not, if we are, are shy or to help us help our students with that but there are things that we can do every single day that count as Indigenous education. Um, if we think about the universal design for learning, uh, giving multiple entry points for engagement, um, you know that's that's what we're doing when we're meeting students when they're at where they're at where we're creating relationships to see where are you at what can you do what do you feel comfortable with uh, so if we look at all of those be best practices um, it just so happens that a lot of them have uh, connections and have similarities